Uh, Alessio, I'm going to go to you. You, you have uh, written a book on uh, good, uh, good for uh, green, good green for growth, or green growth good, or something good, good. growth <laughs> or good. <laughs> and um, you have to read it again. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't remember the title. <laughs> I, there was green, there was growth, and it was good. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so. Uh, tell us uh, where is industrial policy for the green transition in the EU these days and where should it be? So thanks a lot. I still have a few notes. I remember I attended a course uh, uh, with uh, Roberto Magavera Unger and, um, and Dani um, and I remember uh, Roberto starting his talk saying I'm going to argue my point in 12 points. Point one has four sub points. Uh, without one note, without anything. And I was, uh, I was uh, uh, deeply impressed that you managed to do that. I, I'm still human only, so I still have uh, uh, notes. Um, yesterday, uh, Rohit say, started his talk by saying that, um, uh, that in a way, showing emotions is, uh, is frowned upon in the Western culture. I don't know if Italy is a part of the Western culture, but... Uh, uh, being the country of drama, I, I was just going to say, I, the last time I was here, I was a student, I was sitting in, in the audience, Ricardo, you were talking. So now being on the other side uh, feels very um, humbling. I, um, in a way, my, just my introduction, uh, uh, the, the few things I was, uh, was going to say are being uh, spoiled. There was a spoiler in, the, in my introduction. I've been presented as the, the guy of industrial policy as the necessary evil, which is one of the titles of something I've written, so that is a bit the, the, the theme of what I'm uh, going to say in, in these uh, brief, brief remarks. I, I went to an English uh, school. They taught me that you want to start with every essay or, or intervention with a quote. So the quote I picked uh, for, for today is actually uh, by uh, Larry Summers. Maybe it was pronounced in this room. I don't know. And what he was saying about industrial policy is that uh, he would like his industrial policy people uh, to be like his uh, generals. And the idea there is that you want people who can uh, fight the good fight if it's needed, but ideally you hate war. And so you want your industrial policy people uh, in a way to hate industrial policy, but do it and know how to do it well. And the problem uh, sometimes is that uh, the people doing industrial policy are actually the ones that really love it uh, at all costs. So that is a bit how I got to industrial policy itself. I am not necessarily the uh, industrial policy aficionado. I care about decarbonization. I care about reaching net zero. Uh, and in that sense, industrial policy, to my mind, is something that can help us to achieve that. And that is how I got into this topic. That's why I've started uh, writing about this, uh, 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 about this topic. I'm going to make three points. Um, to, to spice things up, I, I was going to give a name to these uh, three points, uh, which uh, we can, I'm a fan of, uh, of Western movies, or uh, spaghetti Western movies, as they're called, given they're made by uh, Sergio Leone. Uh, so it's going to be the good, the bad, or the ugly, and the ugly, or uh, uh, Mariana tells us that everything sounds better in Italian, so we can also call it uh, il buono, il brutto, e il cattivo. Uh, we start with uh, il, uh, il buono, which is to show the good. Uh, which is to say that uh, there are strong, there is a strong economic rationale for uh, industrial policy in the green uh, dimension. Um, just as a, as a small anecdote, I wrote a paper uh, while at the European Commission. I managed to publish a paper, which is an official uh, paper of the European Commission, which talks about industrial policy and, and why we need to do it. And, uh, and I sent it to Dani. This was a few years ago when I said, oh, it's, it's been hard to push this over the line, uh, but, uh, but finally it's there, it's out there. And I got a one-line reply being, well, I didn't think uh, by now I thought that everybody was on board with this thing. I'm surprised that uh, that is still a fight. Uh, well, it is. And to my mind, uh, we are seeing a, a lot of this resurgence of industrial policy. Uh, this has been documented. It has been discussed already uh, yesterday. It is my impression that we are seeing it very much if not predominantly, because of the competitive uh, argument and the geopolitics uh, argument. This has already been raised uh, yesterday. We are not seeing it so much because the economic rationale for it has won 
uh, the hearts and minds of, uh, of, of politicians, bureaucrats. But nonetheless, uh, there is a strong, uh, there are strong economic arguments that I think are worth making and worth uh, underlying. These uh, uh, build on, on literature that uh, some of the people in, in this room uh, have contributed. There is the classic idea or example that you want to uh, break technological lock-ins. And so it is not sufficient to just make sure that the green option is uh, as cheap or as expensive as the uh, brown or incumbent option, because even if that were the case, there are some technological lock-ins within our societies. Think about the infrastructure. So if an EV is just as expensive as an internal combustion engine car, uh, and however, for you to refuel it or, or load it or charge it up, uh, you have to wait miles and miles to find a place, and instead there is a gasoline station every two miles, uh, then that's a problem. And so things like this mean that you want to, uh, this creates an argument in favor of industrial policy to support uh, green, uh, green technologies. This relates also to uh, so-called direct, uh, directed technological innovation. And these papers by Ajay Moglu, I've discovered yesterday that I've mispronounced this name for all my life, and, uh, and Aguillon, um, who have been looking indeed at the fact that if you let companies just do innovation, they will continue building on the innovation that they were doing before because it is a, a marginal improvement um, process. And if you want to, let's say, reorient completely, as you were describing the economy in a different direction, in the early stages, it makes sense to use a strong a lever that can be industrial policy. Uh, there is a, a second argument, a classic argument, is the, the combination of risk aversion uh, with uh, uh, lack of perfect uh, information. And this is the idea that firms will engage or will have a tendency to engage in a waste, wait and see um, type, of, uh, type of behavior uh, just because they don't know exactly. And obviously there are some public, uh, there are some positive externalities uh, if they were to invest in, in green innovation. This incidentally is the same reason why we do R&D, public R&D in general. And so the idea that there are some uh, positive externalities that firms do not internalize entirely, and this is particularly true for the green transition. And, and it is particularly true for goods that are far from marketable. And so you want to do particularly uh, industrial policy or consider it for, for things that are far from market classic examples being cement that we don't know exactly yet how to decarbonize, like aviation that is going to take a good decade or more uh, to fully decarbonize. And, and that is uh, one of the arguments that has been made. And there's finally, there's more, but the final point I'm, I'm going to make on this, on this aspect is the political economy dimension. And it's something that John Rinen has been talking about, among others, which is to say maybe uh, there is an optimal carbon price uh, uh, that you would want to reach, and that would allow you to do the green transition, but politically this is not going to happen. And because politically this is not going to happen, you want to use industrial policy to sort of reinforce uh, or support uh, the green uh, transition. This takes us to my uh, second point of the bad, and the bad is that there are limits to what you can achieve with uh, industrial policy on the green transition uh, dimension. I'm saying this because my impression, maybe I guess I'm coming from the European perspective where we, we still uh, believe in, in carbon pricing. Uh, and I was giving a, a podcast last week to a, uh, it's called the Energy Transition Show. I am told that for people who are into energy, this is the place to be. It's the late night, uh, Saturday night live of, uh, of uh, energy geeks. And, uh, and so I was talking to the host, uh, Chris Nelder, last week, and he was telling me, yeah, you know, like carbon pricing is never going to happen in the US. I think it's a bad idea. So good thing that we're doing the IRA, good thing that we're using industrial policy as a tool to decarbonize. Uh, that, I mean, that's great that you're doing the IRA. That's great that you're using these tools, but there is no way you're going to reach net zero only with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act or only with these type of uh, uh, tools. Uh, it is hard to calculate these things. Some people have tried to do it, but the, the IRA, more or less, ballpark, uh, is equivalent in terms of what it, it will achieve in terms of decarbonization, something like $30 uh, per ton in terms of $30, $35 per ton in terms of carbon pricing. This is far away from the optimal carbon pricing you would need to reach net zero, which means you would need a new Inflation Reduction Act every five years all the way until uh, you reach net zero. This ain't gonna happen politically, but also because you will run out of fiscal, even the US at some point will run out of this fiscal space to do the green transition only through this uh, type of tools. 
so you still need carbon pricing to reinforce the logic. And the final dimension, which is the evil uh, or il cattivo, is that um, industrial policy, to my mind, will lead to further trade fragmentation uh, or the use of it uh, and greater deglobalization. Now, you can separate uh, the, your furniture uh, of industrial policy, to, to mention what you were talking about, in two categories at least. So uh, one is the offensive side. This is what the literature calls it. I'm not making these terms up. The offensive side and the defensive side. The offensive side of industrial policy is typical thing, typically things we like. If I want to simpli simplify, it is things like tax credits. It is things like uh, R&D spending. It is things like supporting infrastructure. All of that is in the offensive side of industrial policy. The defensive side of industrial policy is some, it's something that economists normally dislike more. Uh, and they would say, you know, you don't want to use um, local content provisions. You don't want to use, uh, or only to a limited extent, FDI controls, uh, and so on. And, uh, and, and in a way, it has been framed as if, you know, these are some negative sides that came with, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it's, it's too bad. It should have, have been different. To my mind, the offensive side lays the seed for the uh, defensive side. And so if you're using subsidies to an extent of 300 plus billion and you're putting that amount of money on the table, uh, to a certain extent, the political economy will push you to uh, implement uh, the, the defensive side that we like uh, uh, less. Um, if you are all about bringing technologies or, or nurturing technologies of some sort within your uh, uh, countries, you will not allow companies, foreign companies to come in and buy that technology. And so you will be raising uh, uh, trade barriers. Uh, and that ain't good because uh, obviously you're limiting the amount of tech transfer uh, at the time when you, we know that decarbonization will require this uh, tech, tech transfer across, uh, across the world. To a certain extent, I remain one of the generals that dislikes but still would do. And I go around, uh, uh, let's say, talking about the need for green industrial policy because uh, I link it to other parts of the literature which says, look, this deglobalization was going to happen in any case. And so what green industrial policy is doing is that it's re reinforcing a trend that would have happened in any case. And so we have to be aware of it. We want to try to limit uh, its negative impact, but it was going to happen in any case. And that is why I remain um, convinced of its usefulness. Thank you. Very good. Um